how have you utilized this with leaders in the, you know, that you deal with? How do you determine, you know, how do you really assess their mental toughness and help them get stronger? So I don't really assess mental toughness as much as I assess grit. The whole underlying factor of all of my leadership stuff is I'm going to hire people that exhibit positive leadership traits that are capable. I'm never going to hire a qualified person based on credentials ever right now. There's certain positions where they got to have a certain understanding of right qual like their, their capabilities got to match kind of the job. Right. But at the end of the day, if they're not capable, I'm never going to hire them. Right. Because capable people always overcome. They always find a way to get around something. You know, there are no roadblocks to a capable person. And that's kind of my deciding line where I draw the line with my leaders, right? All of my leaders got to be capable people. You can't have qualified people that are uncapable in leadership positions because then they only have their experiences to go on to solve problems. And my whole thing with leadership is a leader's whole job is to look into the future, see problems, take corrective action now so that those problems don't manifest themselves in the future. And if you're not capable, you have a hard time looking into the future and seeing anything because you're always looking in the past as a qualified person trying to analyze what happened before and how you can apply that to the future. Okay. That makes sense. Now, as far as like um, when you're dealing with grit or mental toughness, what do you do when you, when you're faced with these situations, how do you operate in high, you know, extreme environments with that mental, you know, the critical mind going off on you? So I think, you know, this is one of the things I learned in the SEAL teams. It was just absolutely awesome, right? The more you bleed and train, the less you bleed in battle. And basically, if you're training at a million miles an hour, when you actually get in the game, things will slow down for you, right? Because, like, in the game, like, my players will always say, Coach, the game is so much easier than practice is with you, right? Like, when I'm the special teams coordinator, it's always the same feedback. Practice is maybe the hardest thing I do, and then the games is easy. Right. That's how you want it to be. So practice fast. Right. Go hard. Um, make sure I, you know, this generation is really big on digital learning. So I literally try to send everything to their phones. I don't do a lot of talking in front of them. I don't do a lot of, you know, meeting time and stuff like that because it's not really functional for them. So we send a lot of stuff to their phones, you know, and practice fast. Get them, you know, tuned up, shorter high intensity, fast, maybe not so much hitting intensity, but just speed wise intensity. One of the things that I also notice about you is you've, you've never been afraid to put yourself into uncomfortable situations. Um, like you gave the example of, you know, the situation when you were in high school and how you were dealing with bullies, right? So that's yep. one, one example or top shot and the different shows that you were on, you were in some really extreme environments where it wasn't just about your physical body. It was more so about how you problem solve. So how do you, you know, how do you teach that to these, to, to your people? So, you know, one of the most kind of monumental things that my dad used to do, he wouldn't answer any questions, which was really interesting to me. So like, if you asked him a question, why is the sky blue? His res first response was, why do you think the sky is blue? And what happened was you weren't allowed, like, you stopped asking questions until you really got down to something that you were trying to figure out, right? So like, if I, hey man, why is the sky blue? And then you would think about it, man, the sky's blue because space must be blue, right? And then you go to your dad, I go to my dad, I'm like, hey dad, you know, why is the sky blue? And he'd be like, what do you, why do you think the sky's blue? And I said, well, you know, I think space is blue. And he said, okay. He said, well, he said, it's a little different. He said, you know, the atmosphere refracts right? The sunlight that's coming in from the sun and it refracts it at a frequency that's blue. And you'd be like, oh, okay. And so then when you got asked, why is the sky blue? You weren't just saying something that you got told. You had thought about why is the sky blue? And now you have something to, to say it. And so what would happen is when you got into situations, it would be more so like, okay, how can I get out of this situation? What do I need to do? What correct action do I need to take? to, like I said, as a leader does, prevent failure in the future, right? 
Right. And that's where it came from. Like my dad, I, my dad never answered the question. I tell the story. Like I, I first started driving. So I got my driver's license and I came home. I was thinking I was going to go drive the car. And he was like, no, you got to take all the wheels off the car. It's like, what? He's like, yeah, you got to be able to change the tire. So take all the wheels off the car. I was like, all right. So I went out there, got the jacks out the garage, jacked the car up, took all the wheels off. He's like, all right, great. Put all the wheels back on. So I put all the wheels back on. He's like, all right, you can drive now. And then I crashed it in the back of his, in the back of his truck because I forgot to put the clutch in. So, but like, that's how he taught me things, right? And then maybe six months later, I needed to redo the brakes on it. And he's like, all right, go fix the brakes. He didn't tell me how, he didn't say anything. Five hours later, I had the whole wheel taken apart, the hub, the brakes, everything. And he came out, he said, man, what's taking you so long? I said, man, I'm trying to take, fix the brakes. He was like, all right, let me show you. But I had spent five hours, I had the whole right wheel of the car off, everything, all the way down to the bearings. And he wow. showed me, hey, you know, take these two bolts out right here, get the C-clamp, push the plunger back in, reset the brakes, put them back on, put them two bolts back on. And I kind of looked at him like, yo, are you serious? Like, you had me out here for five hours for something that would take me 15 minutes? But at the end of the day, what he was really teaching me was problem-solving skills, right? And that's why I say, like, a lot of people think you can learn leadership and all this other stuff. You got to have a baseline understanding of how to solve problems, what problems look like. It doesn't come naturally to people to be able to solve problems. And I know, I know why I got it, because my dad hammered me on it. You got to be able to think. He'd always say, you better be able to think your way out of bad situations. So, so that's, how you, that's how you teach your players and, and those that you lead. You teach them how to use their mind to solve problems. So would you say that, like, as far as being... Um, oh, let me, let me quantify that. Sure, sure. I only select leaders that have that capacity, okay. right? Right. I don't select leaders that don't have that capacity. If okay. you can't problem solve with me, you have no position of leadership in my organization, period. That makes sense. That's your number one job. And I can't tell you what the problem is going to be, right? Right. 20 years ago, you telling me you knew what Amazon's problems were going to be? You, you don't. But they got problem solvers, so they're able to solve them and they're able to recover and, you know, make course adjustments. Look at Blockbuster. Probably a whole bunch of great leaders, right? Out of business. True. Yep. Right? So why is that? Because you had a bunch of qualified people in charge. You didn't have capable people that could foresee in the future, take corrective action now, and prevent bad things from happening to your organization. Mm. That makes a lot of sense. So what would you say is your greatest accomplishment as a coach? Man, like, I'll be honest with you. My greatest accomplishment is just simply building champions for life, right? When I get a phone call from a guy that I coached back in 05, and he's running a huge investment company now, or I get a, a call from a kid that was failing out of school, and now he's a cop in Riverside, California, killing life, you know, those are my accomplishments, right? Like, my personal accomplishments – don't mean much to me, right? They just don't. Like, I'm on to the next one right now. Like, I'm going to win the Division One National Championship. That's the next one on my list. When I get that, like, I'm going to be on to being a U.S. Senator. I'm not worried about the last accomplishment that I've got. I'm worried about how, why can I spread the knowledge that I have? How many people can I influence through my mentor and mentee network that I've been prosperously growing for the last 20 years? And, you know, the last probably five years, I've really been pressed hard on making more mentors. So I'm really training my really good mentees how to be mentors because I need to magnify the goodness that I'm giving to people, you know, because a lot of people don't get it, right? A lot of people don't get goal setting. They don't get, you know, they don't understand what a goal looks like. They don't understand how that daily motivation works. When you wake up at 430 in the morning, it's hard to have a bad day. It's hard because you, you're motivated. And yes. when you go from 4.30 to 6.30 working on only you for two hours, right? Like, you can't lose. Like, 12 o'clock comes around and you've already been at work for 10 hours. Exactly. You know? The biggest, so, the biggest and most important work is the work, like you said, that you're doing with your mind and the time that you're taking for yourself to build yourself up before you build others up. You know, it's interesting. When I went to all the leadership deals with the NCAA, they would always say you got to spend an hour, hour a day on yourself. Mm -hmm. You step back and you're like, man, an hour a day? 
And then I look at when I'm doing an hour a day or two hours a day, and I look at when I'm not, far more successful when I'm spending that hour, you know. And now I got a whole family, and that kind of really changes a lot of things because I got a responsibility to raise some kids and be a good husband. So, you know, my time isn't always my time. But I know this, my kids don't get up until 6 o'clock. So if I get up at 4.30, I got an hour and a half to burn trees on both ends to, to, to make some good firewood. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I hear you on that one. Now, my last question for you, Jake, is this. What are the top books that you'd recommend for personal development for anyone that's seeking to develop, you know, self-mastery and to just achieve a higher level of optimal performance? So I'll start with my first book. Um, so I'm big on goal setting, right? I got goal setting in the seventh grade. I started setting goals then, been very – uh, successful with goal setting, goal achievement, right? But I've turned down some incredible opportunities, opportunity to work for Oprah Winfrey. I've turned down an NFL opportunity. I've turned down some awesome opportunities staying true to my goals. And so I just recently read this book called Overachievement. It's absolutely awesome because it says, look, go where the most opportunity is. And it'll lead you back to your goal faster then if you just stay locked in, I'm a football coach. I have to stay a football coach. And so that book is huge. The next one that I just read that was absolutely phenomenal is Relentless by Tim Glover. You know, an awesome book on just what the best look like, what Kobe Bryant does differently, what Michael Jordan does differently, right? What the best do differently, how they're wired differently, right? Remember what I told you. The best leaders in the world look different than everybody else in the world because they are different. They think differently. They see stuff differently than everybody else does. That book highlights that those differences and allows different people like me to be able to say, okay, that is a positive trait that I have, that I have a tenacity to just work through anything. I, you know, I call it brute force. Anytime things get bad, I just go to brute force. Start working 25 hours a day, and I'll fix those problems within two or three months. It's just how it works. And so those two books are awesome. And then the last one is my ringer. So I think to be really good, you got to have a perspective on life. And mm -hmm. to really understand who you are as a person, you got to be able to understand who other people are. So my next one comes out of left field. It's called Next of Kin. It's okay. a book. Champion, uh, chimpanzees that know American Sign Language. And the book is absolutely life-changing from the standpoint that you'll never look at an animal again the same way because those chimps are talking like 400 words and communicating in a way that you are like, that's not possible. But then when you Google it, you can watch them and you can watch the conversations and then you realize like, oh my God, that chimp is the same as me. He just lacks the ability to talk. That's wow. the only difference, really. And then, you know, the more you read the book, you're like, this isn't possible. And you flip between YouTube. Now you got YouTube, right? And you're, you're going back and forth, and you're like, oh, my God. Like, this chimp has been locked up in a testing facility, a pharmaceutical testing facility for 10 years. Hasn't seen this guy in 10 years. And the first thing he says is, Joey, get me out of here. They're sticking me with needles every day. Hell. And hmm. he's with Jane Goodall, right? He said he broke down and started crying. He was there to give them a, a, a positive check on their chimp behavior. And Jane Goodall said, what did he say to you? He was crying. He said, man, chimp just told me, hey, Joey, they're sticking me every day, man. It's awful. I live in this little cage. Jane Goodall said, really? He said, yep. She said, let's go. And they raised enough money to get every chimp out of research facilities across America. Wow. So Jim Goodall wrote a negative letter to the pharmaceutical company, to all the labs, and they got all the chimpanzees out of all the testing and pharmaceutical testing facilities in the country. Wow. Right? But it took a monkey, or I'm sorry, a chimpanzee, a primate, to sign to a guy, yo, I'm getting killed in this cage. Right? So when you think about the relevance of that, of that statement, how does that affect you when somebody on your team is having a bad day, right? How do you look at that person and you think back to this chimpanzee that was locked in a cage for 10 years getting stuck with needles every day? 
right? How do you relate with empathy to somebody that had their mother or father killed, right? Or a small child, you know, I just took on this, this new awesome project that I got. A young lady in Davenport, Iowa contacted me on Instagram. We kind of built up a little conversation and I was like, man, this, there's a lot of depth to this person. And the more I dug, the more I was like, yo, this person could be anything. And she wants to be a nurse, but she got four kids. She got an eight week old. She's not in a bad situation. She's making it. But with a little bit of help, she can be so much better. Right? right. If I didn't read next to Ken, that awesome book on chimpanzees talking, I may not be as empathetic to her situation. Right? I may look right. at her as just another number that she didn't pan out. But the more I learn, the more I hear about her upbringing, she just needs to learn how to do it. She's going to be a rock star. I guarantee you in the next four years, she's a full RN. She has a whole different outlook on life. It may take her a little bit longer to buy a house, but I guarantee you in the next seven, eight years, she's going to buy a house. But right now, I'm raising six to $7,000. I'm going to buy her a used Toyota Sienna, and we're going to get her on her feet. She doesn't have a vehicle right now, so I got to go fund me for that, you know, and – that all comes out of reading a book about chimpanzees using sign language and having a lot of empathy for people and other man. You know what I mean? Right. Right. The, um, I'm going to make sure to put the GoFundMe on the video. So at the end of this, anyone that's viewing, please go to the Go GoFundMe and fund that account. Yeah. And just get, you know, Hey man, all I'm asking for is a big Mac. My big Mac campaign is working awesome. If you give me $2 and I'm winning. Right, we're not trying to raise five hundred thousand. We're trying to raise six thousand bucks. I think we're at like three thousand dollars right now, so we're about halfway there. I got two good vehicles in mind. We'll see if they're still there. If not, I'll find one. Right, about six seven thousand dollars. I'm gonna get her a used Toyota Sienna with about one hundred eighty thousand miles on it. It'll run for another four or five years. And it'll probably run for another seven or eight years, provided with good quality transportation. In that time, I can get her back on her feet get her RN license, get all the other stuff taken care of. She'll have enough income to get her own vehicle, whatever she wants. But like all that comes out of a book about some chimpanzees needing some help getting out of a cage. You know? Wow. Yeah. That's, I'm, I didn't even know anything about that book. I'm going to, I'm going to check that book out myself. Well, all of them, but specifically that one, that sounds like it's pretty interesting. The connections that you made with that. So Jake, where can we find you besides, you know, on Facebook, you know, where, where can we find you? Where are you, where do you hang out mostly socially as far social, as Instagram? I mean, social, social media wise, like, you know, I got this new campaign I'm working on um, Instagram. It's just Jake Zwig 1911. If you Google Jake Zwig Instagram, you're going to find me Jake Zwig Twitter. It's all going to be the same thing. You know, I encourage you to follow me on LinkedIn. Um, I got a little bit longer content coming out on LinkedIn. And then most of my talks or my goal setting stuff is up on YouTube because we're trying to streamline it so that we can feed it to the players digitally instead of me talking to them for 40 minutes. So um, all of that stuff is going up on YouTube. You know, I'm, I'm probably the easiest person in America to get a hold of because I'm always sending my email or my, my uh, cell phone number out on the internet. Cause I laugh. People are like, yo, you don't have crazy people calling you. I said, come on, man. Ain't no crazy call me. I call people. <laughs> right? Like, Crazy people are scared to call me because I send my I send people to come visit them. <laughs> well, Jake, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. And um, man, just keep doing what you're doing, making a difference in the community, making a difference in people's lives. I mean, you are truly a transformational leader. And uh, again, thank you and all the SEALs for their service. All right. Awesome, Mike, man. Appreciate the time, man. Thank you for having me on it, man. Awesome. Uh, bye bye.